All right, cherubs, we're looking at Botticelli's The Birth of Venus. Let's start by identifying some characters. The central figure is, of course, Venus, or, if we're being Greek about it, Aphrodite. She is the goddess of beauty whose gentle laugh could distract the most focused of men and make dim-witted the most clever. This painting is telling the tale of her birth from sea foam. Sea foam that, as the mythologies inform us, was mixed or fertilized with the castrated genitals of the god of the sky. This is a classic story of beauty rising out from muck. To the left, right here, we have Zephyrus, or the West Wind, flying in with a woman clinging to him. Zephyrus represents a pretty little allegory, the gentle warm wind bringing spring back to the world. He's a wind that gently lifts up and carries flowers to the world every spring, and that's who that nice lady is. She's Flora, the goddess of flowers, his sister, but also his wife. On the right side of the painting, we have the Horai of Spring, in a garment seemingly made of flowers, and as Venus is about to step ashore, Spring is ready to clothe her. Now let's talk about that for a second. Venus needs clothing. She is perfectly naked here. Botticelli painted this about 1486, and Europe had not used nude figures in this way for about a thousand years. One could view a naked Eve in agony leaving the Garden of Eden, but there, Eve's nudity would remind us of her shame. Here, with Venus... There is nothing regrettable about her nudity. She is the goddess of beauty. Her nakedness is a celebration. This is a perfect example of the Renaissance, a rebirth of Greek and Roman themes. Classical antiquity had its nude sculptures, and Botticelli has his nude Venus, posed in a strikingly similar way to the Greek sculpture now referred to as the Medici Venus. So let's look at that further. Too often, students of art history are content after they identify what's new about a certain painting. Too often saying, no one's ever done this before, is enough for them to qualify a painting as genius or great or whatever they want. The beauty here, the nudity, is not great because it was first. It's great for so much more than that. To understand this, we need to look beyond art history, beyond history, beyond literature, beyond everything like that. If Botticelli were content to say, I'm a creative artist type, I'm not into science or math, this painting would not be as strikingly beautiful as it is. Botticelli's genius cannot exclusively be categorized by his ability to create soft, sweet lines with his paintbrush, or his ability to break through that nude boundary. His genius could not be taught once a day for 40 minutes in an art room. His world was a much larger place than all of that. We figured there must be some sort of pattern in the painting, so we started to look for proportions. First, we looked at the canvas itself. Its width, according to the Uffizi Gallery, measures 278.5 centimeters, and its height measures 172.5 centimeters. When we divided 172.5 into 278.5, we arrived at the number 1.614. That might seem very uninteresting to you, but this number is very close to a well-known and often discussed irrational number known as phi. Phi is equal to 1.618033, da, 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 and so on. And when the ratio appears in a rectangle, this is often referred to as a golden rectangle. It's a very special ratio that can be found throughout nature. There are a few other examples of the golden rectangle in this work. Here, here, here. We then thought, I bet Botticelli included this ratio in other aspects of his composition. So we started with the horizon line, and we divided the height of the sky into the height of the water, and we got 1.612. That's six one thousandths off. Nothing. Could be a miscalculation on our part to slip up by such a small amount. Then we took a point on the horizon line, her navel, and measured up to her head, then measured down to her heel, and divided those numbers. We got 1.599. That's two hundredths off the golden proportion. Pretty close. We then tried that same trick, navel to head, navel to foot, on the other figures, and found the golden proportion again. Then we got a little crazy and thought, what about the trees? When we divided the length of the branch into the length of the entire tree, we got 1.618. There it is again. Then we thought it'd be really impressive if Botticelli somehow had the ratio of the figures in the foreground to the ratio of the whole painting be the golden ratio as well. To figure this out, we imported a proportionally accurate image of the painting into Photoshop and used the lasso tool to remove the images in the foreground. We removed Venus, Zephyrus, both floras, the trees, some of the flowers, and asked Photoshop to calculate the number of pixels we found they equal 128,818. We then divided that number into the number of total pixels in the image, 215,574, and arrived at 1.673. Pretty darn close to phi. 
and the difference could be our ineptitude with Photoshop. I trust Botticelli a little more than I trust myself. There have been some studies done to disprove the myth that the golden ratio or the golden rectangle is universally beautiful, but the fact remains the human brain is hardwired to find patterns in things. Botticelli's birth of Venus certainly allows our brain to find patterns in things. The ratio 1.618 appears all over this painting, and conscious of that pattern or not, our brains enjoy looking at it. It's a mathematically beautiful painting of the goddess of beauty.